12.32, so I will gently get going. A few people are still trickling in, but that's fine. So it's my great pleasure to see so many of you this afternoon. I'm Georgia Mason. I'm director of Seesaw, which is the Campbell Center for the Study of Animal Welfare. And we're based in Guelph on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, which is one of the initially Narbeck peoples. And this is the third Seesaw um, talk in a mini series on indigenous attitudes to animals in which we're seeking to learn, those of us who are from a settler background, we're seeking to learn from cultures that realized hundreds, maybe thousands of years ago before Darwin, that non-human animals are our relatives and that this really means something. Um, so I'm really thrilled to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Margaret Robinson. Um, she is Micmac, a member of the Lennox Island First Nation. Uh, Lennox Island is based off the coast of PEI, and she's a Canada Research Chair and a professor at Dalhousie. Um, a social scientist, she's cross-appointed in Canadian studies and in sociology and social anthropology. Most of her work is community-based and focuses on mental health and social justice issues in people, especially Indigenous people. But she's also had a long-standing uh, interest in animal issues, which is why she's here today. And she's written and presented under such great titles as Feminist Natives Do Eat Tofu and Is the Moose Still My Brother? if we don't eat him. So she's going to talk today on the disconnect between indigenous traditions, largely centered around wild animals and European colonial ones, especially as they pertain to domesticated animals, giving us one Mick Moore perspective on the knotty question, can intensive agriculture be decolonized? Um, before we kick off, just a, a little housekeeping note, because in our last talk, we were Zoom bombed and my heart rate has only just gone back down to normal. So we're keeping all of your cameras and mics off. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat as they occur to you. Or at the end, you're welcome to raise your, your yellow Zoom hand if you know that I know you or if you know that Margaret knows you. If you are pretty sure we don't know you or we can't recognize your Zoom name, just put your question in the chat and we'll read that out. It's a bit controlly, but I think it just makes it all a bit calmer for all of us. Okay, so without further ado, Dr. Robinson, the floor is yours. Thanks for having me here, Georgia. Uh, I'm trying to reclaim my language, so I'm gonna start by introducing myself in Mi'kmaq. Uh, if you speak Mi'kmaq, I apologize for my poor pronunciation. Gwen in Delewisi Maklet Robinson, Delay Wit Wedjuwig Migmagi, Nesbit Lennox Island First Nation, Wethulsi Muweos, Wedj Lugwe Dalhousie University, Niji G. Namuge Aladu Tirtu Canada Research Chair. Uh, hi, I'm Margaret Robinson. I'm from Migmagi. I'm a member of Lennox Island First Nation. I'm a vegan. I work at Dalhousie University where I teach and hold a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair. And today I'm going to be talking about a Mi'kmaq perspective on intensive animal agriculture. I'll start by saying that um, I am not going to present the Indigenous view <laughs> on anything uh, because there isn't one. There are over 500 First Nations across the continent. Uh, every nation has very different uh, perspectives, practices, sometimes than their neighbors. Um, we're not a hive mind. And so I, I can't answer any questions about what indigenous people think or even about what my own community thinks, uh, but I can give you some general ideas about the sort of values that we hold. Uh, some of the terminology I'll be using to refer to my own cultural group, I'm going to be using the word Mi'kmaq. Um, Mi'kmaq means my kin friends or my friend siblings. And it's a greeting that was popular when settlers first started showing up in our territory. Um, so we would say <laughs> Nibba <laughs> uh, to, is a greeting. And I guess settlers thought that this was who we were. And so I kind of like the name, both because it emphasizes the uh, communication difficulties that sometimes occur when people are speaking different languages. But I think it describes my own attitude toward uh, settlers in our territory, that we, we are first and foremost people of friendship. Uh, the Mi'kmaq call themselves the Ulnu, which means the people. And they refer to their, our language as um, the language of the Ulnu, the, the language of the people. And so when I 
talk about my own perspective as a Mi'kmaq person, I'm talking about the perspective of one friend to others. So you can see the red uh, arrow here that shows approximately where our territory is. Uh, it covers a number of Canadian provinces and a little bit of uh, an American state. And we're part of a Wabanaki Confederacy, which is a um, unity uh, of a number of related uh, smaller nations. And so we're uh, over there on the, the East Coast, if you're not familiar with our location. The perspective on animal agriculture I'm going to present is kind of a negative one. So I'm sorry if like that's your jam, because um, what I'm going to be talking about are three ways that intense animal agriculture violates Mi'kmaq values. I grew up off reserve, so I well, didn't grow up immersed in an Olno community, but I grew up in a big family and we did practice Mi'kmaq values. And the more I learn about Mi'kmaq culture in other areas, the more I can see those values at work in my own experiences. Uh, however, the ones I'm going to talk about aren't necessarily going to be held by all Olnu, although they will be common. Um, the three values I'm going to discuss are non-interference, respect from others, and friendship. So I'll start with non-interference. Most people have never heard of this, uh, so I'll start by explaining what it is. According to the Native Council of Nova Scotia, uh, Mi'kmaq non-interference is the acceptance and respect of others' beliefs, never imposing your own beliefs on another, and not expressing disappointment of someone in public. Um, this comes from Mi'kmaq oral traditions, Mi'kmaq practices. What does it actually mean when we try to practice non-interference? Essentially, it means we don't try to control other people. We respect their decisions. Uh, one way that we might express this is by not offering unsolicited advice. Um, Non-interference also extends to people that in settler culture are generally considered available to be controlled, like children. So Mi'kmaq culture ex uh, exemplifies non-interference with children by not forcing them to do things they don't want to do. So, uh, for instance, in growing up in my household, uh, I didn't have to eat tomatoes if I didn't want to. Um, because, because uh, of the value of non-interference. If I thought they were squishy and gross, I wasn't forced to eat them. Um, other Mi'kmaq parents have sometimes expressed this by not forcing their children to go to the dentist or not forcing them to go to school. Um, in the case of things that are good for us, that um, settler parents might force their children to do for their own benefit, uh, the Mi'kmaq approach would be to talk to the child and explain the benefits of going to the dentist or attending school so that the child themselves would choose to do that. Uh, Non-interference also extends to animals. Um, with children, it's about forcing uh, people to become autonomous decision makers, uh, giving them an early experience of uh, control over their own lives. Uh, with animals, they're already autonomous decision makers. And the non-interference value there would be to not interfere with what's already working well, to allow them the freedom that we would expect to have ourselves. This is all due to the Mi'kmaq perspective that all beings are uh, united in having the same spiritual essence. So here it gets a little religious because uh, most Mi'kmaq view animals and human beings as all the uh, result of a creator deity, a creator spirit. And the, as a result of cre the creator spirit, all of the things that are created, including uh, objects, have a little bit of that spirit within them. And that spirit is something that makes them alive. And so some people have described Mi'kmaq approaches as animistic meaning the view that we have is that everything is alive. And to some degree, I, I do see that present for sure, uh, even in an increasingly secular uh, society like the one we have today. Uh, I also see the uh, view that there is a, uh, what we call panentheism, the idea that something spiritual or divine is in all living beings. And so that's the approach that it lies behind many of these values are those assumptions about the nature of the world, what we would call an ontology, the way we think being works. 
due to all of that and the belief that animals have a spiritual essence, uh, they're treated as uh, autonomous beings. So you're not supposed to make decisions for them. You're not supposed to tell them what to do. Um, it doesn't mean the Ulno won't kill them for food, uh, but they traditionally wouldn't cage or pen them or interfere with their reproduction or alter their bodies for human convenience. Uh, all of which are in many ways standard practices for a lot of animal agriculture. One of the objections to intensive animal agriculture is the enormous negative impact it has on animal lives, removing them from their natural habitats and preventing them from living as autonomous people, autonomous beings. Um, the Mi'kmaq are pretty comfortable with a loose view of personhood. Um, so the, the animal is just as much a person as a human, um, but they may have uh, different needs as a, than a human. And so, some animal supporters have criticized non-interference as a principle because they fear that all human intervention in animal lives would be uh, excluded by the principle of non-interference. And so they ask, well, what about interfering in a way that is meant to help animals? So, you know, if a, an animal is trapped in a flood or a fire, aren't, should we non-interfere there? But in an old new culture, non-interference doesn't mean you can't help animals in need. Uh, in fact, it's, it's a duty to, to help those who are in need. Many Mi'kmaq, for instance, have processed, protested the damage done to animal habitats by resource extraction or by polluting industries. Uh, so for instance, sawmills, um, power generating stations, uh, like dams and such. Um, water protectors fight to prevent Alton gas from flooding the Sabaganagadi River, for instance, with salt so that they could store gas in the caverns uh, under the river. And protests in Elsa Pogtog against fracking and the damage it would do to Ground River um, made the news. A number of Olnu elders were assaulted and injured by the RCMP. So many Mi'kmaq have protested the damage done to animal habitats as a result of um, really extractive resource um, accumulation. The photos of the fracking protests from 2013 by Aussie Michelin, who's an Inuk journalist with uh, Aboriginal People's Television Network, came to represent the land protection struggles in our area. So you can see the picture there in the middle. The photo shows Amanda Pulches, and it's inspired a number of works of art, including this painting by Mi'kmaq artist Loretta Gould. Protecting animal habitats, especially rivers and waterways, is often done by women. And in Elmu culture, they're associated with water due to how the uterus holds uh, water when gestating a fetus. So women are seen as appropriate uh, people to be doing this water protection work um, as, a, as a type of warrior activity. Interfering with animal habitats would break the value of non-interference because we'd be interfering with their, their access to the territory, with their lives in the territory. Uh, from a religious perspective, uh, someone could argue that we were interfering with their relationship with the creator, which uh, is, necessitates uh, access to the territory. And so interfering with animal habitats breaks the value of non-interference, but protecting the territory is a duty that every Elmu would carry. A second Mi'kmaq value that makes it difficult to support intensive animal agriculture is our respect for motherhood. In Mi'kmaq culture, becoming a mother, even at a very young age, is considered a positive thing. Mothers are accorded significant social, political, and cultural power in Mi'kmaq society. Mi'kmaq mothers are generally considered the head of the household and their leaders in their communities. The bond between a mother and child is also important in our culture. Children are often carried or held and breastfeeding extends well into late infancy in some cases. Given the importance of the mother-child bond, animal agricultural practices that interfere with animal reproduction, especially those that separate mothers from their offspring would violate this value. We know that the value of respect for mothers and their offspring extends to other animals because of our protocols around hunting. These protocols discourage the killing of female animals that are reproducing. An example of this can be seen in a story called Muin, the bear's child. It tells the story of Sigo. Um, so traditional stories vary depending on the storyteller, uh, but I'll give you a quick sketch of the Sigo story. Uh, most stories, most versions of the story agree, Sigo gets lost in the forest. 
Sometimes Sigo is uh, portrayed as having wandered off on his own and uh, just gotten lost and turned around in the woods. Other times Sigo is given the character of an evil stepfather who doesn't like him and wants to get rid of him. And so uh, the evil stepfather takes Sigo out supposedly for hunting um, and puts him in a cave and then pushes a big rock in front of the cave in one of the versions. And then Sigo is crying out for help inside the cave and the animals in the region hear Sigo's cry and come to help. But the only animal that can move the rock away from the cave is the bear. Uh, the bear is strong, big enough to move the rock. Uh, in many indigenous cultures, bears represent uh, motherhood, parenthood, uh, sort of the ferocious protection of young. And in some versions of the story, the bear is chosen because uh, Sigo uh, is asked what all the animals eat and selects the bear's diet as most similar to his own. So Sigo goes to live with the bear, mother and siblings. And then one day the mother shows Sigo what looks like smoke rising from the homes of other bears. And his mother explains that these are other bear mothers cooking food for their children, and that the more smoke, the bigger their family. Um, that's an important part of the story, but not yet. <laughs> so one day the bears see human hunters and the bear mother warns Sigo about the dangers that human hunters pose. And at this point in the story, Sigo has been living with the bear mother for a long time, uh, has taken up a lot of bear habits, like walking on four legs, uh, communicates with the bears as if they're speaking uh, in uh, their Mi'kmaq language. Um, and a lot of Mi'kmaq stories have this idea that animals and humans can shapeshift. So sometimes the bear is described as being in her bear form, and then sometimes she's described as being a person, like a, a human being that appears to Sigo. So the story shows that the uh, hunters are hunting for bears and sure enough, the hunters attack and kill Sigo's mother. So here's the quote, Sigo wept over the body of his foster mother and made a solemn vow. I should call, be called Muin, the bear's son from this day on, he said. And when I have grown up and become a hunter, I will never kill a mother bear or bear children. Um, and one of the versions of the story tells us that Sigo kept this vow and he never did kill a mother or bear cubs. Why, why was the mention of the, the smoke important? Well, here we come back to it now. Uh, Elnu Elder, Rita Joe Ock, explains that the cooking smoke is actually the breath of many hibernating bears. And that this breath that can be visible in the woods signals where not to go hunting to avoid killing a mother with cubs. So the breath um, sort of uh, shows up in the cold weather and that indicates where bears are hibernating. So if you're looking to kill a bear but not kill a mother and her cubs, look for very little smoke, indicating the mother's not cooking for a bunch of bear offspring um, or the animals aren't uh, all hibernating together in a big group. Other indigenous nations have similar guidelines about not killing mothers with offspring or not killing animals during a uh, reproductive time period in their lives, like for instance, the spring or something. Products like veal, suckling pig, and industries that separate animals from their mothers would then generally be seen as very negative because they violate this relationship between the mother and the child by interfering with it and separating mothers and their offspring. The third value I wanna talk about is friendship. Uh, friendship is pretty important here in Mi'kma'ki because it's the basis for our peace and friendship treaties. Uh, it's one of the things that distinguishes us from a lot of other treaties uh, which were imposed. Although our treaties resulted from warfare, uh, they are based in an attempt to make friends with people. Um, Mi'kmaq hospitality and friendship is one of the things that uh, came together with uh, Irish, Scottish, and English hospitality to form the value that we have in what we now call uh, maritimes of uh, providing for people who are destitute or people who are strangers, people who need assistance. The uh, maritime hospitality is something people are very proud of here. And I think the Mi'kmaq value of friendship and hospitality has a lot to do with that. So uh, one of the ways that we know friendship is important and that it relates to our relationship with animals is because of a character called Glooskap. Uh, Glooskap is the Mi'kmaq cultural hero, sort of a Superman figure. He's uh, usually presented as exceptionally large and tall, um, sometimes as uh, almost uh, 
uh, a giant. And uh, the Mi'kmaq creation story talks about how Glooskap was formed from the sand of the ground, that the creator formed a human shape out of the dirt, which is why Glooskap is red. And that always makes me think of the red sand of Prince Edward Island uh, in of the Lennox Island area where my ancestors came from. And so when Glooskap is first born, when he first comes to consciousness, he's trapped on his back in the dirt, in the sand from which he was emerging. Um, and one of the Mi'kmaq ways of describing where you're from is to talk about you sprouted from, uh, kind of like we're, we're plants coming up out of the ground. And so when Glooskap is first born, uh, he can't move, but he sees the animals moving around. And so the animals pre-exist um, Glooskap. And then the creation story talks about how uh, Glooskap was released from the soil so that he could play with the animals and be their friend. And so this relationship between Glooskap and the other animals that uh, make up the territory uh, is, is really about friendship. Uh, Glooskap has a best friend, Abistanoich, the American pine martin. Uh, this is a picture of Abistanoich here, uh, sort of a weasel, sort of a cat, uh, <laughs> but super cute uh, with ferocious teeth and claws. Intensive animal agriculture is being a bad friend to animals. It's not emulating Glooskap. Um, Glooskap is often presented as uh, doing things the way the Mi'kmaq should do things. So when you hear a Glooskap story and Glooskap does something, uh, that's an indication to me as a Mi'kmaq person, this is the way it's supposed to be done. Glooskap has uh, supernatural knowledge, uh, special knowledge that exceeds that of a regular person. That's not to say Glooskap never hunts. Glooskap uh, not only hunts, but also teaches the Mi'kmaq to hunt. But uh, you, uh, he doesn't engage in activities that resemble how animals are treated in factory farms. Uh, the Mi'kmaq have to show respect to animals, including those killed for food. Um, so one of the Mi'kmaq stories is about a Mi'kmaq family that is starving. It's winter, uh, all the food is gone and uh, they're going to die. And then a moose comes to their wigwam, uh, to their house and says uh, uh, that if they make an agreement with the moose to uh, only show respect to the moose, to uh, show respect to the moose body, to use all parts of the moose uh, and to treat the uh, bones of the moose with respect, then the moose will sacrifice themselves to feed the Mi'kmaq. However, if the Mi'kmaq break this deal and fail to show respect to the moose, then the moose won't come anymore and the Mi'kmaq won't be able to catch any and the Mi'kmaq will die. And so the, uh, the agreement with the moose kind of acts as a, an exemplar for how the Mi'kmaq view animals that uh, they, there's a general belief that animals sacrifice themselves to feed human beings. And so the story of the moose helping the starving Mi'kmaq uh, is done out of friendship. The moose feels bad for the human beings. Usually showing respect involves a ceremony of some sort. So there are different ways if you've uh, killed a moose to show respect for the animal and indicate to other moose that the animal was harvested according to the respect protocols that were part of the agreement. Uh, so moose have a little um, bit that hangs down under their chin called a dewlap. Uh, one way to do this is to hang the dewlap in a tree as part of a ceremony to show that you have uh, harvested the moose according to the protocols. Uh, animals are generally, uh, their bones are taken and returned to their natural habitats. There's a belief in reincarnation among many Mi'kmaq, the idea that your relationship with the animal crosses multiple lives that animal might have. Uh, there's a story where the animals, uh, is in response to a song that a special man sings, comes back to life. Um, and there's a story about a pot of food that never empties. And so this idea that animals somehow regenerate uh, automatically, but carry with them the memories of how you treated them uh, are important because it means that if you, as a hunter, mistreat an animal by being excessively cruel, then the animal won't let you catch it anymore. Um, and it will tell all its friends not to let you catch them either. And so there's this idea that you're in a social relationship with animals, even if it is one sometimes of consumer and consumed. There's also a traditional story about Glooskap being tricked by Malsum, a wolf. Uh, Malsum is sometimes presented as Glooskap's twin brother, uh, but Malsum means wolf. 
And uh, Melson creates this new animal that he calls Lox. Uh, in this story, Mel, uh, Glooskap is presented as having created the animals, which doesn't jive with the creation story that I've read at all. Uh, so it's interesting to see this different version. Uh, in this story, the Melson character creates Lox, and Lox runs around stirring up hatred among the other animals against human beings. Uh, so for instance, Melson goes to the bear and says, if you ever caught a human, what would you do with him? And the bear says, well, I guess I would eat him um, and encourages the, the moose to think about, uh, fantasize about throwing human beings up into the North Pole with his heavy antlers to just fling them off, uh, make them go away. And so the uh, idea that the moose was once much larger and was shrunk by Glooscap as part of a punishment for uh, not being friends with human beings uh, emerges from this story. Uh, in the story, Glooscap punishes all the animals by having humans hunt them. Um, and there's uh, even a few uh, old drawings, one of which is called uh, Glooscap, Glooscap killing his brother wolf, uh, where he's holding a big club that sort of looks like a, a, a paddle and uh, is about to strike a wolf. However, uh, even in this story, which kind of is used to justify why humans uh, hunt and kill animals, there's an interesting bit here about the respect protocols. Now that you have power over even the largest wild creatures, you said, yet I charge you to use this power gently. If you take more time than you need for, if you take more game than you need for food and clothing or kill for the pleasure of killing, then you will be visited by a pitiless giant named Famine. And when he comes among men, they suffer hunger and die. And so it's similar to that agreement with the moose uh, in that story, where uh, in this one, even though they're killing animals and hunting them for food as part of a punishment, trying to justify why this is part of the relationship with animals, uh, there are respect protocols that go along with that punishment. So if we're to apply the Mi'kmaq values of non-interference, respect from others, and friendship to our relationship with other animals, then we would have to say intensive animal agriculture is probably not going to be accepted as a Mi'kmaq practice. As it's currently practiced, it would just wouldn't meet the criteria of the animal respect protocols. Now, that doesn't mean that Mi'kmaq people don't uh, purchase food in a grocery store. Um, most people do not hunt for their own food. However, the values that come from that hunter relationship, that uh, hunter history, um, are still very current, even among people who do not themselves hunt. Uh, many Mi'kmaq do still hunt and gather. Uh, so there, there are ways in which those ceremonies and these associated uh, values and protocols do still get engaged uh, when people are hunting. And so it's, uh, it's an interesting time period because we've got increasing secularity amongst everyone in Canada, uh, which means that a lot of the uh, spiritual beliefs that undergirded uh, these values are not necessarily the values of contemporary Mi'kmaq people. Uh, some Mi'kmaq people, uh, like myself, are secular people. And so uh, the question then is, what do these values uh, respect? What do they uh, stand upon then, if not a particular religious ontology? Uh, another issue is the uh, loss of Mi'kmaq culture that is connected to food and built up around food and the relationship between the Mi'kmaq and the animals. So for instance, we could risk losing a lot of our traditional ceremonies if we don't uh, practice the food activities that we're uh, initiating those ceremonies. So when people hunt, for instance, they might put down tobacco and say a prayer, often Masit Nogama, which is all my relations, which recognizes that human beings are related to other animals um, and thanks the animals for their sacrifice. And so people do not do this when they go to the grocery store. Um, people don't put down tobacco at Sobeys. So it's um, engaging in the settler food practices is potentially damaging to Mi'kmaq culture by uh, moving us away from activities that used to engage those cultural practices uh, and kept them current. And so uh, a lot of my work looks at how do we put Mi'kmaq values into practice in different ways that can be incorporated into someone's daily contemporary life. 
And food is one of the ways uh, because it's something people do every day, everybody eats. Um, so I've tried to live my Mi'kmaq values by being vegan. Uh, it seemed to make sense to me, but uh, it's not traditional for our people. So I think 95% or even higher of the Mi'kmaq traditional diet was animal products. Um, so it's, uh, it's a challenge everybody has, but because of the value of non-interference, people don't usually tell me that I'm uh, <laughs> wrong for doing that, uh, for choosing to live the values in the way that I do. Uh, similarly, because of non-interference, I don't go out and proselytize and try to convert people to veganism. Um, but I will talk about the values and how I see engaging them in my life, um, which is more of a... <laughs> traditional approach <laughs> to not tell people what to do but just tell them a story which suggests what they might consider doing um i'll uh, stop here and say thanks um if anyone wants to reach me that's my email address mrobinson at dial.ca and uh, i'm always interested in hearing what kind of work other people are doing and how it might relate so uh, thanks for having me here georgia and i'm happy to uh, stay and have a conversation Brilliant. Thank you so much. So let's give uh, Dr. Robinson a big round of applause, real or virtual.